In World War II Britain, sirens like that were the warning of an imminent air raid. And in parts of the US today, a siren sounds to warn of a tornado or hurricane. In this podcast, I'll look at the ancient Greek myth that associates sirens with danger, and then explore one instance of the reception of this myth by a contemporary poet, Canada's most important living author, Margaret Atwood. It is this kind of interface between the distant, exotic past and the modern world that keeps me hooked on classics, the study of the stories, languages and cultures of the Greeks and Romans from more than 2,000 years ago. My name is Susanna Braund, and I'm privileged to hold a Canada Research Chair at UBC. My title of Professor of Latin Poetry and its Reception describes my expertise. In a contribution to Western intellectual history, I am investigating what happened to some of the greatest Latin poetry in the period since antiquity. For example, I am exploring the reception by later eras of Virgil's foundation narrative of the Roman race, his epic poem, the Aeneid, written in the 20s BCE. Even a superficial analysis of the different translations, imitations and appropriations of the Aeneid through the years reveals many different Virgils. There are proto-Christian Virgils, Catholic Virgils and Protestant Virgils, Royalist Virgils and Republican Virgils, proto-fascist Virgils and anti-Nazi Virgils. In the dialogue between the past and later eras, there's lots of room for different interpretations. And so it is in the case of the sirens. The sirens were mythical female creatures, two or three of them, with the wings and feet of birds, who lived on a rocky island and with their beautiful singing lured passing sailors to their deaths on the rocks. Homer in Odyssey Book 12 offers a gruesome picture of the sirens lolling in a meadow with men's corpses heaped up around them, skin decaying upon the bones. To travel past the sirens safely, Odysseus is told to plug his crew's ears with wax as they row by, and have his crew bind him to the mast and not release him until they're well past the island. This is a quintessentially misogynistic myth, in which the sirens typify women as dangerous seducers of men. This is not surprising, ancient Greek society was nothing if not patriarchal, and the vast majority of Greek myths are focalised from the male point of view. But that fact leaves plenty of room for modern reimaginings of these myths from the female perspective. Some cases that come to mind from 20th and 21st century literature include Marguerite Yourcenar's 1935 prose poem, Clytemnestra, or Crime, the British poet laureate Carol Ann Duffy's zany and often satirical imaginings of the stories of invisible wives of famous men of myth, fiction and history in poems called Queen Herod, Mrs. Midas, Mrs. Tiresias, Mrs. Darwin, Queen Kong, Frau Freud and more in The World's Wife, published in 1999, and Margaret Atwood's novella, The Penelope Ad, 2005. All these writers take familiar mythological material out of the realm of storytelling and give it mundane trappings in what has been well termed a postmodern domestification of myth. Often, these ventriloquizations of women from Greco-Roman mythology seem deliberately to ask disconcerting questions about these familiar stories. These examples, and many more, are manifestations of the sheer intellectual exhilaration of unleashing the imagination, the best kind of what-if thinking, akin to the project of the intellectual poets of 3rd century BCE Alexandria, who set out to reimagine the heroic world from unusual angles. Examples include Callimachus in his Hecale, where the hero Theseus is offered hospitality in a shack by an elderly woman or Theocritus in his treatment of Polyphemus, in which he turns the uncivilised one-eyed Cyclops into a lovesick youth. The Roman poet Ovid does the same kind of thing too in poems called Letters by Heroines, in which he imagines what the silent women of myth would have said in letters to the men who had abandoned them, or who they were waiting for. 
He imagines Ariadne's letter to Theseus, Medea's letter to Jason, Penelope's letter to Odysseus, and so on. So what does Margaret Atwood do with the story of the sirens? In her 1974 poem, Siren Song, she refocalises the story from the perspective of one of the three sirens, producing not exactly an apology, but something more complicated. It starts, This is the one song everyone would like to learn. The song that is irresistible. The song that forces men to leap overboard in squadrons, even though they see the beached skulls. That last detail showing Atwood's familiarity with the Odyssey. The siren speaking then offers to tell the listener, you, the secret, in return for help with getting her out of this bird suit. She says, I don't enjoy it here, squatting on this island, looking picturesque and mythical with these two feathery maniacs. I don't enjoy singing this trio, fatal and valuable. Then the seduction starts in earnest. The siren lures the listener closer and closer with the promise of the secret and the claim that the listener is unique. Only you, only you can help. Finally, abruptly, the seduction achieves its goal. Alas, it is a boring song, but it works every time. Now, I believe that the ghastly humour of the close of the poem is informed by another intertextual influence at work here. The clue is that Siren's Song is one of a collection of poems called Songs of the Transformed, including Pig Song, Bull Song, Rat Song, Owl Song, and so on. A collection that shares the Roman poet Ovid's preoccupation with transformation in his epic Metamorphoses. Now, Ovid, too, has an account of the Sirens in Book 5 of his poem, According to him, the sirens were changed from humans into bird-like creatures at their own request. Originally, they were the companions of Proserpina, wandering through flowering meadows when she was violently abducted by her uncle Pluto to become queen of the underworld. Like Proserpina's mother, Ceres, they searched without finding her. Finally, they prayed to become birds so that they could search better. The gods granted their prayer but left them with human heads so that they could continue to sing. Atwood is surely familiar with this version of the myth. When we link Atwood's siren with the maidens in the myth of Proserpina, the poem's chilling conclusion becomes an understandable manifestation of man hating revenge. In other words, Atwood has read and understood well the ancient sources for the story of the sirens, both Homer and Ovid. She has refocalised the myth from the male to the female perspective, not only asking herself what it would be like to be a siren, but also thinking about the song of the sirens and the motivation of the sirens. The poem seems to me an affirmation of the archetypal image of the destructive woman, but also a satire on male weakness in listening to the siren song and wishing to be unique in women's eyes. Further, it offers a vivid imagining of the tedium of a siren's existence and an acknowledgement that that tedium might account for the relentless destruction of the hapless men who are entranced by the song. This is not a pleasant poem. When we recall its 1970s context, it is reasonable to see the siren as articulating a strident and violent brand of feminism that was prevalent then. We might remind ourselves that Atwood's poetry volume, Power Politics, published in 1971, three years earlier than this poem, brought her the reputation of being aggressively feminist. But it would be too easy to say that Atwood is using the siren as a mouthpiece. As usual with Atwood, when she's exploring themes of sexual politics, she's always ready to reverse genders, giving us female oppressors and male victims. In other words, Atwood's siren is far from straightforward, but a figure of ambiguity and duplicity, like others in her work, such as Xenia in The Robber Bride. The siren lures us in, lulling us into the illusion that we're dealing with a familiar paradigm, the dangers presented by the seductive woman, taken from one of the West's cultural master narratives. But the vicious close of the poem turns the tables not only on the siren's male victims, but also on the reader's. 
when the misogyny of the myth is exposed and replaced with man-hating, the rug is pulled out from under our feet, and we seem to have nowhere left to stand unless we want to self-identify with the siren. This brief example shows how modern appropriations of ancient myth permit endless reinvention, refocalization, and renewal. Myth is always available to articulate both the certainties of the dominant culture and the challenges to those certainties. Atwood's Siren Song is a classic example.